Good evening. My name is Father Robert Invelli, uh, not Father Michael Himes, uh, but I too am in the theology department. And I would just like to take a moment to put this evening's presentation in the context of this adventure of faith series that we are sponsoring in conjunction with the church in the 21st century. Uh, one of the undergraduate panelists uh, last Thursday in the inaugural event spoke about how impressed she was when at mass on Sunday she stopped to think that throughout the world people were reciting, were praying the creed. Our series, the Adventure of Faith series, is based on the creed, uh, not merely the that of the creed, but the what of the creed, the creed that introduces us into the inexhaustible mystery of God. We had two lectures to begin the series last spring. Father Michael Himes gave the first lecture on the Trinity as the shape of the creed, and Professor Thomas Hibbs gave a lecture on belief in the God who creates. Tonight, we are addressing what is probably the hinge article of the creed, the article which makes the church specifically Christian, the article which treats of the incarnation of God in the human world. And to introduce our speaker of this evening, who by uh, popular demand has come back for a second lecture in the series, I'd like to present John Zeller, a junior in the Lynch School of Education, to introduce Father Himes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Boston College, McGuinn 121, and Church of the 21st Century's program, Adventures in Faith. He's a diocesan priest in the Brooklyn Diocese of New York. Ordained in 1972, his ministry has brought him to Boston College, where he is professor of freshmen fulfilling their core to grad students preparing for their doctorate. As one of his former students, I can attest to his genuine care for each member of his class and their ability to learn. A sensational speaker, it is a privilege to stand here tonight and present to you Father Michael Himes. Thank you, John, and thank you, Bob, for the invitation. And thank you for coming. It's a great honor to speak with you this evening. I must say, I was struck by those announcements that are all over the campus. Father Heim speaks. <laughs> I would say if ever there were redundant announcements, it's that Father Heim speaks. Uh, the, great discussion, the great discovery would be Father Heim shuts up. Uh, uh, that hasn't happened in a very long time. Uh, the fact that he speaks is just a yet another occasion. Uh, as Father Impelli said, this is the hinge article of the creed. This is the center of everything. It is interesting, for example, that traditionally when we recite together the creed in a liturgical celebration, it's when we come to the statement that the word was made flesh. It's when we come to the statement of the incarnation that traditionally we bow. It is the crucial moment in the creed. And I thought to begin with, if you will indulge me for one moment, I'd read to you the classic statement of the doctrine of the incarnation. This is the so-called Chalcedonian formula. There had been much debate, discussion about what it means, who is Jesus? What do we mean when we pray to Jesus? Why are we praying to Jesus? Not only through Jesus and with Jesus, but to Jesus. How does that happen? What does it mean when we profess that Jesus is God? What does it mean when we say that Jesus is human? How do we understand that statement? Much discussion had gone on throughout the fourth century and into the beginning of the fifth century. And finally, at the fourth ecumenical council, the fourth council that we traditionally recognize as speaking as, as the whole church and to the whole church, the Council of Chalcedon, this was the formal statement of belief. It's the classic statement of belief in the incarnation. This is what the 
bishops assembled at Chalcedon in 451 said, in accord with our holy predecessors in the faith, we all with one voice at one consent teach and confess the following about the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is both perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, truly God and truly human, with a rational soul and a body, consubstantial with the Father as regards divinity and consubstantial with us as regards our humanity, like us in all respects except for sin, begotten before the ages by the Father as regards divinity, and in the last days also for us and for our salvation from Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, as regards his humanity. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures, which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation, at no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same, only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ, just as the prophets taught from the beginning about him, and as the Lord Jesus Christ himself instructed us, and as the creed of our ancestors in the faith has been handed down to us. That's the classic definition. So that's what we affirm as believers about the Incarnation. But now the question is, what does it mean? And I want to take a leaf from a very good friend of mine and an occasional colleague here at Boston College, because on numbers of occasions he's come to teach with us here at BC, a very distinguished British theologian named Nicholas Lash, who for many years was Norris Hultz professor at Cambridge University. Nicholas, in his first published book, almost 40 years ago now, Nicholas referring to this definition and speaking about the claim that Christ is truly divine and truly human, truly God and truly a human being, said that obviously there is much to be discussed and as we try to plumb the meaning of the statement that someone is truly God. And there's much to be discussed, much to be examined, when we try to examine what it means to say that someone is truly human. But that the really interesting word is and. What does it mean to say that one is truly divine and truly human? Because certainly it doesn't mean an addition sign. It's not simply, yes, he's God and also, by the way, human. It's not putting together two different things. It's not mixing together things. You notice that the, uh, the fathers of the Council of Chalcedon are at great pains to say it's not a mixture. It's not a compounding. It's not as if you take, you know, two tablespoons God, one tablespoon humans, bring to a boil, and poof, you've got Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, it's not a mixture, it's not an addition, it's not a juxtaposition. You simply bracket together, divided human. What does and mean there? That's really the heart of what I want to talk with you about this evening. What it means to say that we believe that Jesus is truly divine and truly human. The peculiar beating of the word and. But I've got to be roundabout in getting us there. I'm going to ask you to take a little detour with me. When I was first ordained, the, the, the glaciers were just receding from the last ice age at the time. I remember fighting my way through saber-toothed lions to get to the cathedral to be ordained. Um, one of the questions that would come up with absolute regularity, I could bank on it, when I was invited as someone fairly recently ordained, to speak at adult education functions at many parishes in my home diocese of Brooklyn and Art Island. 
One of the questions that invariably came up, it was a very hot question that had been discussed for some time in theological circles, and at this point, more and more people who were not professionally theologians were sort of getting aware of the conversation and wanted to know, what is this about? And the question was, did Jesus know he was God? And if he did know he was God, when did he find out? At what point did Jesus learn he was God? I mean, what they were thinking of was the rather hard to imagine picture of uh, knowing the diameter of the planet Neptune uh, and saying to himself, well, hang on, 1756 years and we get Mozart. Um, if that seems incredible, what does it mean to say that Jesus knew he was God? Did he know he was God? And when did he find out he was God? And my answer to that question is very unsatisfactory. But it's the only answer I think I can give. The answer is, I could tell you that if you could tell me when you found out that you were you. You see, the point is, we don't learn about ourselves as an item of information. There isn't a particular point where I can say, ha, Michael Himes, I now know what that is and I'm it. <laughs> it's very hard to examine our own consciousness of ourselves. It's notoriously difficult, indeed impossible, to exhaust examining someone else's consciousness of themselves. Think, for example, of your best friends. I mean, people who you know very, very well. But haven't you found yourself at times puzzled as you try to understand what they're saying or why they're acting the way they're acting? I just don't know what he's so worried about. I can't figure out why she's so angry. I just don't understand why he's so insulted. I can't figure out why she is so upset about this issue. That people we know very well, it's extremely difficult to get inside them and look at who they are, how they understand themselves, how they experience themselves and, the, and what goes on around them, why they feel the way they feel. Well, if it's so difficult to understand another person whom you know very, very well, if it's so difficult to understand yourself, and who do you know better than you know you, how immensely difficult, indeed, how utterly impossible it is to try and get inside the consciousness of somebody who, by definition, isn't like anybody else who ever lived. Since there isn't any other instance of incarnation, since it's not a case of, ah, yes, Jesus is one of those incarnations, is he? Since Jesus is an utterly unique figure, since no one else is truly divine and truly human, how could we possibly think we could kind of get inside Jesus' head and say, this is what it must have felt like. This is how he must have experienced it. This is how he got to know himself. So the question, when did Jesus know he was God, is, I haven't a clue. What tipped him off, I couldn't tell you. The fact is, it's an impossible question to ask. So the right way to go about getting at what does it mean to be truly divine and truly human is not to try and get inside Jesus. That's the wrong way to do it. Indeed, there is only one right way to do it, it seems to me. And that is to do what we do with anyone whom we're trying to understand. We pay great attention to what they do and what they say. We listen very closely to what people say about what they hope or fear, what they want or dread, what they love or dislike. We pay great attention to what they say about themselves and we pay great attention to how they act, what they do. So if you want to know what it means to say that Jesus is truly divine and truly human, if you want to know what the and could possibly mean, the only way to get at it is pay great attention to what Jesus says and to what Jesus does. Now, I might point out that's especially important when we're talking about Jesus, because if we say, as for example, the beginning of the fourth gospel says, that Jesus is the word, 
made flesh, that Jesus is the Word incarnate, then I would suggest to you, when we say that Jesus is Word, one of the things it means is, it's not the totality of what it means, but it's certainly part of what it means, would be to say that Jesus is what he says, and he, and he does what he, is, what he is. That Jesus speaks himself, and what, what is himself is what he speaks. That you want to understand Jesus of Nazareth, look at how he expresses himself in what he does and in what he says. Now, what does Jesus say and do? Well, let me point out some odd things about what Jesus says and does. I mean, we all think we know that because, after all, we've all read the New Testament. We've all heard the Gospels read Sunday after Sunday, day after day throughout our lives. But there are some very odd things about it that we don't always appreciate. For example, isn't it interesting that the earliest Christian texts we have, which, as you know, are not the Gospels, but the authentic letters of St. Paul, that if the earliest of the Gospels are written probably in the 60s of the first century, the earliest of Paul's letters are from the 50s. So a good 10, 15 years before the Gospels as we have them are the letters of Paul. And of course, Paul writes constantly about the risen Christ. Has it ever struck you that Paul says almost nothing about what Jesus said I mean, it's absolutely astonishing when you look at St. Paul's letters that he almost never quotes Jesus. He talks about Jesus, and what he says about Jesus we'll, have to, we'll turn to in just a moment. But he really says very little about anything Jesus says. He never quotes any parables. He never says, ah, oh, yes, well, on that Jesus taught. No, no, don't tell us anything about what Jesus taught. Indeed, to the best of my recollection in St. Paul, there are only three times that he implicitly quotes Jesus. One is in 1 Corinthians 7, when he's talking about divorce and remarriage. And he says that from the Lord, he's been told that it is wrong to put away one spouse and to remarry. So he's heard that, that Jesus said something about that. He knows that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he tells us that I'm, I passed on to you what was passed on to me, that the night before he died, the Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and said, this is my body. And he took the cup after dinner and said, this is the cup of my blood given for you. So he quotes Jesus on the institution of the Eucharist. And in one other place, he says, when he's talking to his readers, the recipients of the letter about how important it is to be charitable and how good it would be if they contributed to the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem who were experiencing a famine and who were in great need of money. Uh, he suggests to them that they were to contribute to them generously and he says, because we know the Lord said that God loves a cheerful giver and that it is better to give than to receive. Those are the only three times in all of Paul's letters that he quotes a single word that Jesus said. And the interesting thing is the third of those quotes are partic is particularly striking because it's not in the Gospels. See? If Jesus said it's better to give than to receive and God loves a cheerful giver, the Gospel writers don't record it. Only St. Paul records that. He really says very little about what Jesus taught. He doesn't seem to think that's the big thing he has to preach. He's not here to preach to you the kinds of things Jesus taught. Because if he is there to do it, he's doing a desperately bad job of it, since he never bothers to quote it. What he does think is important is to tell you about what Jesus did. But once again, notice what he tells us about Jesus' actions. He doesn't say a syllable about Jesus ever having healed anyone. He doesn't say a syllable about the raising of Lazarus. He doesn't say a word about curing the blind. He doesn't say a thing about healing the sick, casting out demons. Not a word. Not once does he ever make reference to it. What he says is that Jesus was obedient to the will of his father, died and has been raised again, and is now in glory where he has sent his spirit. That's what Paul thinks is all important to say about what Jesus did. It isn't about healing. It isn't about teaching. It's about being obedient to the Father, 
Dayak rising and Sedic the spirit. That's the key issue for the earliest Christian documents we have. So if you want to find out who Jesus is, look to obedience, Dayak, rising, and Sedic the spirit. At least that would seem to be what St. Paul says. If I can put that another way, let me go from St. Paul to the fourth gospel, to John's gospel. Do you remember in chapter 14 of John's gospel, Jesus says, now I'm going away, but I'm going to the Father. And don't be concerned about that because you know how to get to the Father. And Thomas pipes up at the Last Supper table and says, just tell us how to get to the Father. And if you just do that, then everything will be fine. We'll know just what you're talking about. And Jesus says in response, I can tell you the way to the Father. I am the way and the truth and the life. So this is how you get to the Father. And then Philip, the disciples are always asking obtuse questions, as you know. Uh, Philip gets to give the, the, the last, well, not the last, the really last obtuse question uh, in John's Gospel gets given to Peter. It's only right. Um, but Philip gets to give to the next to last really dumb question in, the, in John's Gospel. He says, Lord, just show us the Father, and then we'll be happy. And Jesus says, have I been with you all this time, and you still haven't gotten it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whenever you see me, you see the Father, because the Father and I are one. Now, what is he talking about? When you see me, you see the Father. Well, we could go into a long, learned examination of the Trinity at this point. You will be immensely happy to hear I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, what I'm going to suggest to you is that Jesus say, is saying, when you experience me, what you are experiencing is the reality of who the Father is. So when you see me, when you see what I do, when you hear what I say, when you see how I act, when you discover who I am, you're discovering the real presence of the Father. Good. But now let us turn to the Synoptic Gospels. Let us look just briefly at what the Synoptics, unlike St. Paul, they tell us a lot about what Jesus said. But one of the remarkable things is how little he says about God. I mean, if Jesus has come to reveal the Father, well, he certainly is rather cryptic about it. He doesn't say much about God. He doesn't give much instruction about God. He talks an immense amount about the kingdom of God, but that's a little bit different. It's not God that he describes, but what it's like to be united with God. And, what it's, and how one is united with God. How one comes into the kind of relationship with God that God wills. That's the kingdom of God. He speaks a great deal about that. And I suggest to you that that's what you see when you look to what Jesus says and what Jesus does. What you see is what it's like to be in a really right relationship with God. That if you want to see the kingdom, you look at Jesus of Nazareth. And what is the kingdom? The kingdom is to the way one can be related to God. And if you say, yes, but how do I find out who this God is that I'm supposed to be related to? The answer is, enter the relationship. You don't, first of all, get information about God and then start trying to come into connection with God. You try to enter into a relationship with God and then you discover who God is. You see, it's not unlike friendship. The way in which, there's, if you want to, you all know this, but if you want to kill the possibility of a friendship dead as a doornail, if you want to murder an incipient friendship right at the start, the best possible way to do it is to say, let's sit down and talk about being friends.
If anything will kill a friendship, that'll do it. Let us sit down and analyze our friendship. Ugh. It'll murder it. It'll strangle it in the cradle. In fact, what happens is you begin to discover what your friendship is. You begin to discover who your friend is by being a friend. So the way you discover who God is is not to learn a lot of information about God and then try and strike up a friendship. The way you discover who God is is you enter into a friendship with God. You enter into the kingdom. You enter into a relationship with God. And bit by bit, you discover who God is. So that, in fact, the kingdom of God is our experience of God. There isn't something else that's our experience of God, and then we begin to live in a relationship with God. It's only by entering into the relationship that we know anything about God at all. So it is the discovery of the kingdom that leads us to understand who God is. God is revealed to us by entering into the right relationship with God. That, I suggest to you, is what Jesus reveals to us in everything he says and in everything he does. This is what it's like to be somebody who's a friend of God's. This is what it's like to be somebody who lives in the kingdom. This is what it's like to be somebody who is in a right relationship with God. And the more you see that, the more you discover both who Jesus is and who God is. But what about this humanity business? I mean, after all, as we saw at the Council of Chalcedon, God, Jesus does not only reveal who God is, Jesus also reveals what it is to be a human being. He's just as really a human being as he is God, truly divine and truly human. So if he reveals to us who God is by revealing to us what it's like to really live in a right relationship with God, how does he reveal to us what it's like to be a human being? And the answer is exactly the same way. Because it turns out that that, that being in a right relationship with God is not only the way we discover who God is, it's the discovery of what real humanity is. That human beings are made to be friends of God. So once you discover what friendship with God is like, you're not only discovering who God is, you're discovering who you are in your truest, deepest, richest reality as a human being. That's what's being claimed. But the only way to do that is by entering into relationship with one another, if I may. Point out to you another remarkable use of the word and. We're still coming back to and. Remember, that's, this is all a big, long detour to get us back to and. In my end is my beginning, as T.S. Eliot says. We're going to end up where we started, talking about and. But let me point out another use of and, a law root. Indeed, it's a story that revolves entirely around and in many ways. Do you remember in Matthew's Gospels, back in the middle, that a scribe comes up and asks Jesus a question? And the question is, what's the most important commandment? To love God with your whole mind, heart, and soul, or to love your neighbor as yourself? And Jesus says, these are the two great commandments, love God totally and love your neighbor as yourself. Do that and it fulfills all the law and the prophets. In Luke's gospel, a scribe comes up and asks Jesus the question. And Jesus flips the question around and says, well, you're a scribe, you're very learned in the law, you tell me what, it, what you think is the most important commandment. And the scribe says, well, some say love God with your whole mind, heart, and soul, and some say love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, good, you do that and you'll be fine. And the but then the scribe does not want to let him off the hook. So the scribe says, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus then tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, you notice it the Good Samaritan story, clearly, clearly, obviously, overwhelmingly obviously, the central point of that parable is that uh, everyone is your neighbor. 
that there is no difference between being a Jew or, some, or a Samaritan, that racial and, and, uh, and gender and national and religious differences melt away. Everybody is your neighbor. That's obvious, and it's true. But there's another point to the story. Do you remember there are three people who come on the man who's been beaten up and left bleeding on the side of the road? And the first two are a priest and a Levite, two people who are temple officials, on their way up the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And they both see the man bleeding on the side of the road and pass over to the other side and go on their way. Why bother to make it a priest and a Levite? In a story with so few details, I mean, we don't know anybody's name. We never find out what happens to the Samaritan. We never find out what happens to the man who got beaten up. Very few details, and yet we're, we're pointedly told not just the two people passed by, but a priest and a Levite. And they didn't just pass by, they went over to the other side of the road. Why do you think that's true? I suggest to you because they're going to Jerusalem as good temple officials to fulfill their functions in the temple. But to go into the temple, you have to be clean. You have to be kosher. And if you come in contact with blood, it makes you unkosher. So they can't stop and help this guy because they'll get bloody. And if they get bloody, they can't worship in the temple. So the poor guy, we have to let him go and on our way to the temple. Whereas the Samaritan couldn't care less about the temple, so he stops and helps the man. You see, the point that Jesus is making is a secondary but very important point the parable is not only is everyone your neighbor, but remember the conversation started as a question about what's the biggest commandment? What's the most important one? Loving God or loving your neighbor? And what Jesus is saying implicitly in the parable is, listen, if you think you can draw a distinction between the two, not only don't you know who your neighbor is, you haven't a clue who your God is. If you think you can play off loving God or loving your neighbor, you don't understand either one. It's a very important, notice it's about and. What is the relationship of loving God and loving your neighbor? In Mark's gospel, we get the same story, except now Jesus says in response to the question, you should love the Lord your God with your whole mind, heart, and soul, and the second is exactly identical. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this time, the scribe, instead of walking away annoyed because Jesus has avoided a trap, the scribe says, well done, Rabbi. Good answer. Nothing is more important than loving your neighbor, and there's no sacrifice that can be offered in the temple greater than loving your neighbor. Obviously, he's been reading... The Good Samaritan parable, he got the point, you see. Um, and Jesus then says, you are very close to the kingdom of God. Notice, it's the, old, it's the biggest compliment paid anyone in Mark's gospel. You are very close to the kingdom of God. What is it that gets you close to the kingdom of God? If you know that I didn't say two things, I said one thing two ways. That loving God totally and loving your neighbor really are two sides of one coin. If you got that, you know, you've got the kingdom of God. You, you're very close to it. You've, you've seen the point. And indeed, Mark's gospel underscores it by saying, and after that, no one ever dared ask him another question. <laughs> See? There was no, nothing left to ask. See? You want to know what the kingdom is? Here it is. You got it. If you know that loving God and loving your neighbor are two aspects of one reality, congratulations, you've seen the kingdom. You know what the right relationship with God is. You know what it is to be a friend of God. The only way you could be a friend of God is to be a friend of God's creatures. That is only by entering into relationship of love with one another that we can ever be in a relationship of love with God. Indeed, the New Testament says that again and again and again, but probably it never says it more bluntly, more insistently, more frankly than in the first letter of John, when the author of the letter says, look, anybody who says that he loves God whom he doesn't see, but doesn't love his neighbor whom he does see, is a liar. He's not telling the truth. He's not telling the truth either because he's hiding it or because the poor dummy doesn't know the truth.
but you can't love God and not love your neighbor. They are two parts of one reality. You can't do it. That to love God is to love your neighbor and vice versa. And that, I suggest to you, is why it's so important to hear about the stories of Jesus curing people. There was a time when people kind of, this would not have been true of the first 1700 years of the Christian tradition. But starting at the 18th century, people started looking to the stories of miracles in the Gospels, especially Jesus healing people, as ways of demonstrating that Jesus is divine, and therefore because Jesus is divine, he's telling the truth, and therefore you better listen to what he says. So all these miracle stories got trotted out as kind of proofs of Jesus' divinity. They're not about proving Jesus' divinity. That was never the point of recounting the stories of the miracles and the Gospels. The point of the healings of the Gospels is to reveal the immense compassion, the adorbous concern, the deep mercy, the desire to heal, the desire to cure, the desire to restore health to people, which is at the core of who Jesus is. Why? Because if you see what Jesus does, and you listen to what Jesus says, you find out who Jesus is. That Jesus is the embodiment of the gift of self to others for their well-being. That's what he is. That's what he says again and again and again. And that not only tells us who God is, it tells us who we are. It reveals to us what it is to be a human being. A human being is one who is created to become a friend of God by becoming a companion of all the other friends of God. That's what it is to be human. It is by entering into relationship with all of God's friends, the whole of creation, that we become a friend of God. And that's what we were, what we were created to be. So that what is revealed is both the fullness of divinity, that God is ongoing gift of self to all of creation. And it reveals to us what it is to be a creature. It's to be one who, who delights in, who shares that gift by entering into companionship with all of the other friends of God. So what does and mean? I suggest to you that we might be least wrong if we understand it to mean in light of and because of, and to read it in both directions. Jesus is truly divine, in light of being truly human. And Jesus is truly human, really, fully, totally human the one absolutely totally human being who's ever lived because of and in light of being really God. That if you really are the fullness of humanity, if you really are one who is absolutely in love with God and God's creatures, totally open to friendship with God, then you will be totally filled with God. You will be God. And if, because God is the one who is God by endlessly giving himself away to others. Fullness of humanity, fullness of divinity. Let me quickly draw a few corollaries from that. Right? Because after all, the subject of what I was to talk about this evening is believing in this. What difference does it make? I mean, is that something that we just say, ah, well, you know, I wasn't sure what incarnation meant, but then I went and heard Himes, who in half an hour just brilliantly expounded the whole thing. I wept with joy, and my whole life has been changed. <laughs> uh, well, yes, of course, I do trust that will happen to you, but um, what difference does it make if all of this is true? What difference does it make if we believe that? Well, the differences are immense. Let me just point out a couple of key ones to you. At the moment, in my section of uh, exploring Catholicism, we're reading Dante. Now, I don't know if any of the 
people that I'm privileged to teach at that class are here this evening, but if they are, stop your ears, because we haven't come to this yet. Uh, I'm going to tip you off on where we're going with Dante. The hundredth canto of the Divine Comedy is the point at which Dante attempts to do what can't be done. And of course, he attempts to describe the beatific vision. He attempts to describe the vision of God. Well, of course, he fails. He just fails less than anybody else who's ever tried, uh, typical of Dante. He says that when he comes into, when he first sees God, when he's led to the very pinnacle of, the, of, the, of paradise, the outermost circle, the, 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 the heart, the, the, that which moves everything else, it is like a light which burned his eyes, but even as his eyes were burned, they were also being strengthened. So his sight is as at once both dazzled and somehow being healed, being made stronger. He can bear the light more, even as his, his, light, his eyes are being destroyed by the light. And as they grow stronger, he sees that the light is really coming from three great concentric globes, each of a different color, but together making one great white light was an image of the Trinity. But then he says, and as I gazed at that light, it seemed to me that the middle globe, the second globe, the sun, okay, bore inscribed upon it a likeness exactly of me. And then my mind was caught up into love that I cannot express, save to say that now I know the love that moves the sun and all the stars, the love that makes the whole universe to be. The climax of the Divine Comedy is the point at which Dante looks into the depths of God and sees someone who looks just like him. How is that possible? Because if we affirm the incarnation, then we are saying that now, not 2,000 years ago, at this instant, there is one thing that you and I share in common with God, and that is humanity. For a very long time, uh, I used to think that the worst celebrated feast in the church's liturgical year, and there's a lot of competition for that title, let me tell you, um, that the worst celebrated feast in the church's liturgical year was the Feast of the Ascension, because we used to celebrate it as, the, as a kind of divine bon voyage party. Um, I mean, after you read the Gospel of the Ascension, actually people would come out and put out the Easter candle. It was kind of, it was kind of a visible symbol of, well, he's not here anymore, but hang on, he'll be back someday. That's exactly wrong. It's not a story about Jesus going away and coming back sometime. It's the celebration of the glorification of humanity. You see, it's not, it's not a story about how the Son of God came to earth, disguised himself as a meek-mannered carpenter from Nazareth, but was in fact faster than a speeding bullet, could leap high buildings with a single bound, uh, and after a certain time shuffled off this mortal coil and went back to being God. It's the story about how God, having united God's self to humanity, takes humanity into the glory of the Godhead. You see, the point of the ascension is it's not a de-incarnation. It's not about Jesus not being incarnate anymore and going back to being God. It's about the taking of the humanity into God with Jesus. It's about the fact that, to use the traditional language of the creed, what sits at the right hand of the Father in glory at this instant is somewhat like you and me in all things except sin. That you and I and God have one thing in common. We're all human. And if you don't think that's got consequences, if that's true, how must you treat, first of all, yourself? And how must you treat 
the people sitting next to you and in front of you and around you? How must you treat your roommates? How much, much you, how must you treat, how must you treat the professors, God knows. Uh, how must you treat one another? Because all of us share humanity with God. If that is true, think of the staggering dignity of being a human being. Indeed, if you believe the incarnation, that you realize it's the single greatest compliment ever paid to being a human being. That humanity is so splendid that God has chosen to be human along with us. I mean, you want to talk about good news? That's good news. When Paul talks about the mystery hidden from all generations revealed in our time, that's it. If I can put it this way, I often like to say that the mystery hidden from all generations revealed in our time is God's secret ambition. God's secret ambition is God has always wanted to be exactly like Himes. <laughs> in all things except sin. That God has chosen to be what we are along with us. If that's true, the dignity of the human person is literally breathtaking, and it demands your dignity, my dignity, and the dignity of everyone on this planet is so staggering that it demands nothing less than reverence. Secondly, it also suggests that if you want to become like God, that the way to become like God, if we believe in the Incarnation, is to be as human as you could possibly get. That whatever deepens, enriches, expands your humanity, whatever makes you more free, more loving, more intelligent, more, uh, more braver, more creative, more imaginative, whatever opens your spirit, enlarges your vision, deepens your capacity for love and self-gift. Whatever makes you more human is simultaneously making you more like God, because humanity is what you and God share in common. That's an extraordinary claim. If it's true, let me point out to you, it transforms what this university is about. Why ultimately should there be a Catholic university? not in order to teach doctrine, and we lure you in by also teaching about management and economics and English and history, but what we're really after is giving you doctrine. I mean, we're not a catechetical institute. The whole point is the deep Catholic incarnational conviction that if you are going to, if you become more fully human, Everything that expands you and enriches you and enlarges you is the work of sanctification. It's the work of making you more like God. If that's true, of course universities are part of the church's mission. Not because they teach doctrine, but because they help form human beings. And whatever makes you more fully human is the work of, of grace. So obviously, the meaning of this university gets transformed if we truly believe in the Incarnation. And finally, it says something about what it is that we're supposed to be giving to one another. I mean, when I say finally, I don't mean to say we've exhausted the implications. The implications go on and on and on and on and on. Finally, in terms of what I want to say about these implications of the time I have this evening, it says an enormous amount about what it is we are to give to one another. You see, what we are to give to one another is the possibility of genuinely being opened in friendship. The single, you hear a great deal about rights today. I mean, there's much written about human rights. There is much said about human rights. In church documents, much is said about the church's responsibility to foster human rights. What is the most basic right of a human being? More basic, I think, than the right to life or liberty 
I think the single, if we take the incarnation seriously, it seems to me that the single greatest right of a human being is the right to love. Not to be loved, but to love. The single most basic right of every human being is to do what God is. It's to, it's to give oneself away to others. Whatever it is that enables us to give ourselves away to others, whatever brings us into deeper, richer, truer contact with other human beings and their needs and their hopes and their dreams and their fears and their desires, whatever links us ever more deeply into real, true, honest communion with one another, whatever does that, that is our work for others. That we are people who are supposed to be building a genuine communion of human beings so that each one is more empowered to love the others. That's the kingdom of God. And that, I suggest to you, is not only what Jesus teaches, it's what Jesus enacts. And if you look at what Jesus is, at what he says, you discover who Jesus is. And what you discover is, simultaneously, the absoluteness of the self-gift which is God and the perfection of the reception of that gift which is humanity. Truly divine and truly human. That's what was affirmed at the Council of Chalcedon. That's what we affirm every time we bow our heads at the statement that the word became flesh. That's what we believe that makes us distinctively Christian. It is, believe me, if anything deserves the name, it is good news. It is gospel. Thank you very much.